Welcome back to Let's Code. I'm Chris Biscardi, and today we are diving into the deeper depths of Bevy. And on our journey in learning shaders, we are going to go into WGPU. We've been writing shaders for a little bit on this channel, and WGPU is the uh, sort of graphics implementation or the shader uh, crate that Bevy uses to enable us to do all the nice things that we've been doing. So when it comes down to it, WGPU is a graphics library that allows us to write things like WGSL that implements the WebGPU API, or at least is inspired by the WebGPU API. If we use WGPU, then we get to target platform-specific graphics APIs like Vulkan, Metal, DirectX, and OpenGL. There are, uh, I think, two specifically GPU implementations or GL implementations for the browser. One is WebGL2, and the other one is WebGPU. So we're going to skip over WebGL, and we're going to look at WebGPU right now. WebGPU is basically the uh, next generation of being able to access the GPU on from the browser. Obviously, what we're going to do today is a little bit of WGPU and a little bit of browser work. If you've seen the other shader videos on my channel, you'll know that Bevy uses WGSL as its first class shader language. And there is also a WGSL or WebGPU shading language spec in addition to the WebGPU spec. Today, we'll be going through Learn WGPU. Learn WGPU is a series of tutorials. I'll bring out the side menu here. There are about 12 of them in total. It covers from the absolute basics of WGPU through to loading a model. And we are going to go through this with the intent to further our understanding of the underpinnings of Bevy's render pipelines. So thus we start at learn WGPU with dependencies and the window. In the beginning, it gives us a list of crates. So let's get a new uh, cargo project going here. So I've created a new project called learn WGPU. Of these dependencies, Winit and WGPU are the most important. I'm actually not going to use nvlogger or log. I'm going to use tracing and tracing subscriber because I feel that tracing is the standard for logging and distributed tracing in the Rust ecosystem. And we should be moving towards that in general. That could be a mistake depending on how tied to nvlogger this tutorial is, but we'll see. So if we look at the versions here, we end up with winit 0.27.2 and WGPU 0.13.1. These seem like versions that are likely to work, so let's see. There's a note here about using uh, the second generation resolver in our cargo.tumble, but since we're using uh, Rust 2021, we don't need to specify this in our cargo.tumble. The document says it's very important to enable logging via nvlogger init, so we'll make sure we get tracing subscriber format init in here. It does note that if we don't include nvlogger in it, WGPU will fail silently. I believe that tracing subscribers should pick up these nvloggers, so I'm not really worried about it, but we'll find out. If it seems like things are being silent, we'll switch over. And then it just kind of wants us to dump this in. So I've created a lib.rs here, and we also have our main.rs. The code that we've dumped in is in lib.rs. And I'll get rid of this nvlogger. It says that this creates a window and keeps it open until the user closes it, but we don't have run yet, so we need to call run. In this case, because I called the package or the crate um, learn WGPU, we are importing from learn GPU or learn WGPU run, which is this function in our lib, and we can call it down here. I've also left the logging construction in main.rs because I feel like that's where it belongs. It doesn't really belong in the library code. So it's saying that that's enough to support desktops but it didn't tell us to run it ever, so let's give it a run here. One thing that I didn't mention is that Winit is also the windowing uh, system used in Bevy. So what we see here should look very familiar if you've run a Bevy app. It looks a lot like Bevy's window. That didn't really explain what's going on here. So let's take a look at this code and see if we can figure out what it's actually doing. So all of the uh, items that we've brought into scope come from Winit. So this event loop is no different. and we won't really look into what event loop actually is. We just need to run one so that we can create a window. Then we use the window builder to construct a new window builder. This is often called a builder API, even though all we're doing here is this one uh, dot build call. I assume that there are other options that we could put in here if we wanted to. 
Like if I decided to make the window have a title of learn WGPU, and then we ran the window again, we can see at the top that there's learn WGPU here. So when we create the window, we can do it with different things here. All I'm gonna leave with title because I kind of like it. Then we uh, build by passing the event loop in and we unwrap that because presumably that comes as a, uh, or rather that is an issue. If the window builder fails to create the window, then we can't continue with the rest of the application that's trying to display visual things. If we can't have a window, we don't have anywhere to put our stuff. So if this goes wrong, we just want to crash and panic. This is, uh, you know, a tutorial. So like there's no recovery here. Uh, the program should just crash for us. Then we run event loop dot run. This moves the arguments into the closure or moves anything that it captures into the closure. I don't see us moving anything in here. Oh, there's the window. Okay. So the window gets moved into this closure and then we get event underscore control flow. So let's take a look at what event loop dot run is. So run initializes the win it event loop with the closure that we give it. In the type signature, this closure is static. So it does have to own everything that it's accessing, which is why this uh, move is here in the first place so that we move the window in so that the closure owns the window. Any values passed or any values not passed to this function will not be dropped. That's an interesting way of phrasing that. I wonder what it's doing under the hood. So here we can see we have an FN mute. If you're familiar with the closure traits, there's FN, FN mute, and FN once just specifying what kind of access these closures have to their surrounding environment. The arguments for this closure are an event, an event loop window target, and control flow, whatever control flow is. I don't know what it is yet. So in this case, we match on the event. If it's a window event, then we handle it. If it's not, then down here, you can see that we don't handle it. This ref syntax here is taking a shared reference to the event. So instead of matching on this, and moving this event value, we are only taking a reference to it. It's very similar to if you wrote the ampersand. Uh, I don't think we have one in this program right now. So it's very similar to if you write the ampersand, but because the, the ampersand in a match, so if we put it like this, we would be, or anyway, something like that. If we did it more like this, um, we would be saying that we want to match on a reference to the event. Whereas this says we want a reference to the matched event, slightly different. We, in this case, we get a reference. In the other case, we're kind of matching away the reference. And then we also get a window ID for this window event. This is still part of the match, this if statement right here, it's called a guard. So in this case, we're matching on the window event. So if this event is a window event, we get the a shared reference to the event and the window ID. And then we use an if expression to test to see if the window ID is equivalent to the window that we created. If this if expression is true, then we continue and we do run the body of the match. If it's not true, then we would fall through to the next match, which is the underscore. And then this event is not the same as the event we just matched on. This event is a shared reference to the event inside of the window event. So this is just shadowing the event name uh, and referring to this reference instead of referring to this outer event. And this pipe syntax means that we can match on either one of these. So this window event close requested enum variant or this window event keyboard input window variant. Both of those match here. Otherwise, we aren't matching anything else and we do nothing. So if it is keyboard input as opposed to close requested, then we're still matching even more. This is kind of like a really nested match here. It's, it's kind of uh, getting hectic. Um, but we match on the keyboard input struct uh, for this variant, which has a field called input that has a keyboard input that has state and virtual key code inside of it. That is an element state pressed. And it, so basically this whole thing is saying like, if we're pressing the escape button, it's a little bit verbose. Um, this is basically saying that because we're still matching on this struct, we don't really care about the other, uh, fields that might be here. So there's state, there's virtual key code. There's probably, let's imagine there's something called key code or something like that. These dot dots mean that we don't, we don't care. So if we pressed escape or presumably we hit like the X on the window to close it out, then control flow equals control flow exit. In this case. 
we aren't setting the control flow variable. We're setting the value that control flow is pointing to right now. So when we start this closure, control flow refers to something somewhere else, right? And what we want to do is not change what control flow is containing. What we want to do is reach into control flow through this dereference operator. We want to dereference it back to where it's uh, contained this value, right? And we want to set the contained value to control flow exit. So in this way, we kind of like reach into control flow and place this uh, exit value there. Now that's kind of super weird, <laughs> but I think that this is just the way that when it works. So in this case, control flow, pull, wait, wait until, or exit with code are the four things that we could do here. So basically after this event loop is over and, and it's going to run again, this control flow, whatever is in that variable defines what we're going to do next. So in this case, we exit next. So all of that brings us to being able to run this window. So at this point we can add support for the web. There's not much going on here. We're just opening a window. So I'm curious to see what that looks like from a web support perspective. So in this case, uh, it wants us to set the library in cargo toml to a C dilib or an R lib. So this is a dynamic C library. Um, I don't know that I've actually seen our lib before. So if we go into the rest reference, we can see that under linkage, there are a number of different crate types we can use. In this case, there's bin and lib, which are uh, crate types that we should be used to because main.rs is a bin and lib.rs is usually a lib. But we also have dilib, which is a dynamic library, or static lib, which is a static system library, or a C dilib, which is a dynamic system library that's compatible with C, I believe. And there's quite a few others. One of them that we'll get into soon is a proc macro because we've been talking a lot about macros lately. So we need rlib for desktop and c dilib for the web for specifically wasm. So this is interesting. In this case, we've got config if equals one. And then if, so this is something that you may never, may not have seen before. Um, if the target is equal to wasm32, then we can set more dependencies that we might need when we build this. In this case, um, it uses the same CFG kind of flag or macro or whatever you want to call it. Um, the config to detect whether the target architecture is WASM or not. If it is, then we get these dependencies. If it's not, then we don't. So config, config if then is not actually anything special. It's just another dependency. And that's what enables this target. So note that I copied this out of the web page, which means that we have WGPU here in the dependencies and WGPU down here with the features. So let's make those features or those versions both the same. So we need to use WebGL right now because um, I didn't start my browser with the experimental flag that we would need to support uh, WebGPU. So we need to target WebGL, which is the same thing that Bevy does basically. The console error panic hook makes it so that if we do panic, that those get outputted as console logs to the browser console. Console log implements the uh, logging API. Now, I don't know that we actually need this because we do have tracing. Uh, but we'll find out. And then of course, wasm bind gen for actually binding to our wasm and web sys for a bunch of APIs that we would usually be able to access from JavaScript. So in lib.rs, we can use that same CFG uh, macro. In this case, we're gonna set the target arch to wasm32 or test whether the target arch is wasm32 or not. And if it is, then we are going to pull in the wasm bind gen prelude. We'll do the same thing down here using config attribute. If the target architecture is wasm32, then we specify this run function as being where wasm bind gen should find the start function. There is some logic here to detect whether we are running in uh, wasm land or not and setting a logger based on whether we are or not. The logic in this um, tutorial is a little bit awkward. It feels like it should be telling me where to put this a little bit more. Um, again, we don't have env logger here. And because it's telling us to set up the logging inside of lib, we're going to do that. I'm going to add this crate that I just found when I was looking for wasm support for tracing and to get tracing web to work, we're going to do a version here and a features format for tracing subscriber. So I've set up tracing subscriber with the time feature, which yields us this extra UTC time here. You can see that because our target architecture inside of VS code is not wasm that it looks like those aren't being used. 
but they will be. So that sets us up with, actually, we need to get rid of Vlogger here. And then I've just dunked uh, Wasm32 on top of everything that we are using in Wasm32 and leaving the tracing subscriber stuff um, otherwise available. So now we've got the panic cook and we've got some setup for tracing subscriber web. So now after we create the event loop in the window, we do yet another config flag for Wasm32. You can see that we actually don't really do anything <laughs> without flagging it for Wasm32. And then basically what this is doing is setting up a canvas window for us. So we use WebSys to get the window, then the document, and then we use the document to get this Wasm example ID, which I'm gonna call, um, actually, I'll leave this. Um, we're just gonna call it Wasm example. This is an ID that will be in our HTML when our learn, G, when our learn WGPU example runs in the browser. This is our canvas. We append the canvas to the body and then that's it. And if it fails, then we say, hey, couldn't couldn't do that. It's telling us that their preferred approach for doing Wasm builds is Wasm pack. So let's take this and paste this random code into our terminal and just run it because we trust everybody on the internet, right? <laughs> so we should have Wasm pack version 0.10.3. So apparently we can do Wasm pack build on this project and watch it build. Okay, so that built at the package directory. So right here with all of our JavaScript Wasm and stuff like that. Um, I don't think that we're gonna go into it right now. So we're just gonna leave that directory alone. Now we could do what it's saying to do next, which is basically uh, do the Wasm pack build with a target of web. So if we do that, yada, yada, it goes into package. And then it wants us to use this HTML file, which uses some ES6, which is cool. This is going to go because of this path right here. That's how I know it's going in the root of our project. So we paste that in. This is not Pong with Wasm. Uh, I don't know where that came from. So let's do learn WGPU. And that's not Pong either. So I assume this was copy pasted somewhere for this tutorial because this is learn WGPU.js. And if you're not familiar with ESM or ES modules, JavaScript modules, uh, they were a thing that came around in about 2014 that we used a whole bunch of Babel plugins and other translations to start using, but now they're actually in browsers. So we can import init from this JavaScript file, which happens to be this package learngpu.js, and then we can call init, which returns a promise that we log out Wasm loaded afterwards. And then the canvas color is black. So if we do what, like npx serve dot, so if we do a static web server in the current directory, and I load this in the browser, does it work? Couldn't append canvas to document body, stack, runtime error unreachable, finalize init. So let's dish that whole directory for a second and rebuild, and then we serve it, refresh the page, and we're getting the same result. Couldn't append canvas to document body, so we are getting this uh, console logout for a panic cook. Let's see, let's do this. Let's do info here and see if our Wasm pack build target web, refresh this. It doesn't look like that's getting logged out. Unsupported time. There we go. Time not yet implemented on this platform. Um, what did I do to solve this last time? Wasm not implemented on this platform. I forget what package we have to install. We have to use some other instant. Um, it might've been the tracing web stuff that I included. So let's do this since this video is getting a little bit long. Let's uh, remove the tracing stuff that I put in and I'll go back later and plumb that back in. I do wanna use this for the desktop, so we'll keep it around. And then we'll add nvlogger and console log like it wanted us to. Actually, we didn't need nvlogger now that I think about it. Let's cargo remove nvlogger. And then we do console log here and let's do a Wasm pack build target web because I commented out tracing info. All right, cargo add log because we need that. Can't append document body. Okay, so after debugging this for a little bit, it's really important to note that the get element by ID, this Wasm example, for some reason for me was not working, which is fine. I'm sure that there's something here that I could fix, but instead I swapped it out for document.body and you can see that the canvas was added to the body here. So I'm not sure why that didn't work. Um, they don't actually show a working example in the actual tutorial here. 
So it is one of those things that if you go through this on your own that you have to be careful of, just note that instead of get element by ID, you can do document.body and then that will unlock you and you can move forward. I also switched to Wasm Server Runner because I like it a little bit better for doing development. And what that means is I can do cargo run target Wasm32 unknown unknown instead of running Wasm pack and trying to run a static server. So this works. And you can see all the logs here that I actually uh, did use to figure out where the actual problem was. Um, also note that I've been using warn because the default tutorial sets the log level to warn instead of something like info. Um, so I was using info, which is why nothing was showing up. So a couple of foot guns there in the tutorial, but we do now have a window running. And if we cargo run in general, we should still have our window and we do right here. So that's the first iteration of learn WGPU dependencies and the window. In this case, we've installed a bunch of stuff. I think I'm going to try to get back to, onto using tracing again. Um, I do need to fix that time issue. I will check what the current state of the art for using tracing inside of Wasm is. And in the next video, I will bring that up and show you what I did. But until then, we've got a window with Winit that runs both on the desktop and in the browser. And we've got a canvas being added in the browser. So we've got a bunch of Wasm stuff. We've got a bunch of desktop stuff and we're all set up to do WGPU stuff in the future. I'm gonna make a series out of this. So the next one we'll go over is the surface and then we'll go over pipelines and buffers and indices and everything like that. So you can consider this series of videos as an intro to the underlying WGPU uh, elements that power Bevy. And hopefully we'll learn a little bit more about how pipelines work in Bevy along the way. So I hope you enjoyed this and I will catch you in the next video. If you wanna see the code, it's in the description as always.